briefly um, about the aesthetical and technical concerns uh, encountered while creating or performing online, for example. And uh, we will be uh, welcoming uh, this afternoon artists and performers uh, who will be presenting their artistic process and explain uh, also uh, issues related to creating or adapting their artwork uh, to virtual spaces. And uh, uh, to begin uh, the session, I uh, will be happy to welcome uh, Ellen Varley Jamison and Beth Gates. Uh, welcome, uh, Ellen. Welcome, Beth. Uh, you can come on, on, on stage. And this first session uh, is focused on performance in real and virtual spaces. Uh, and uh, ah, Ellen, yes, I didn't see you. So I will. So I, can, I can come here so I can see you both. Great, uh, great. Uh, so welcome, welcome again. I will uh, present you uh, to the to the public. So uh, Helen uh, Varley Jamison is uh, a writer, theatre practitioner, and digital artist from New Zealand, uh, based in Germany. She holds a master of arts investigating cyber performance, uh, uh, which means live online performance which uh, she has practiced since uh, 1999. She co-founded AppStage, a web-based venue for cyber performance in 2003 and uh, has co-curated many online festivals and events. Helen uses digital and online tools to address current environmental, political and social issues in projects, including mobilize, demobilize, we uh, have a situation, or uh, excuse my German, maybe, and or sprach barlich, sorry, uh, tales from the towpath and makeshift. Uh, Helen is active internationally in open source feminist uh, and theater and digital art networks. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Ellen is a, a pioneer uh, in the field of uh, online performance and she's the first of coining out the term of cyber performance and she will be presenting uh, today, uh, uh, um, uh, explain the term and uh, uh, explain also the history behind AppStage. Uh, Beth Cates uh, is an award-winning lighting, set projection, and mixed reality designer, a leader in new forms of performance creation with emerging digital tools. Uh, she uh, was the virtual lighting designer for uh, Double Eye Studios, groundbreaking VR performance, uh, and is a proud member of the Double Eye team. In 2021, Beth will lead Canada's first artist residency for VR performance creation, She's the founder of Playground Studios and Digital Alchemy Creation Lab, and she has presented at the Prague uh, Quadrennial Laval VR and many others, uh, other uh, event and festivals. Beth is a three-time nominee for the Simini Novich uh, Prize. Her best production to date is her son, Aaron. <laughs> so I hold on to, <laughs> hold on to speak of that. So maybe we can begin uh, with the you, Helen. Welcome uh, again, and the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Yes, perfectly. Great, okay. I managed to get here to the lectern, all good. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm just, I'm not sure whether I should put up my first website or if um, Harriet is going to do that. I can do it anyway, um, I think. I'll just put that up here. So, are we seeing it? Excellent. 
Okay, so um, that was a, a great introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk today about this term cyber performance that I coined in 2000 um, and about how I came to that term and also then about the upstage platform, which is um, what's keeping me very busy at the moment. Um, so as Alan said, I've been working in this field since 1999. And in 2000, I coined this term cyber performance, describe what I was doing because there, are, there were and are very many different terms from networked performance, online performance, uh, virtual theater, all these terms, but none of them really felt right to me because I felt like what I was doing, uh, it had elements of theater, it had elements of performance, it had elements of, of every different art form, but it was also in itself something else, something more. Um, and so I put together these words, uh, cyberspace and performance. Um, it also has connections to uh, cybernetics, which is the sort of human machine interrelationships uh, and cyber feminism, which is another area that I'm really interested in. So I developed this term um, in 2000 and I've since written a thesis about it and somebody has put it on Wikipedia. So there's plenty of information out there if you want to look it up and find out more about it. Uh, but the, the two main fundamental things about cyber performance uh, are firstly that it is live. So liveness, it's like theatre, it's live performance, live art. The artist and the audience are sharing the same moment of time, even if they're not sharing the same physical space, it's happening in the same moment. Um, it's an experience together. It's not about coming in and looking at uh, some artwork after the artist has finished it and gone away. And the second thing is that cyber performance is situated on the internet. So it doesn't exist without the internet. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work that is um, streaming performances from a, from a space, from the stage um, or other things that it, putting work online, which is, of course, in these times when we can't go places, it's really fantastic that we can see, see theatre work online. But cyber performance is particularly about using the internet as the site for that performance. Um, so I came to this term and this, this kind of performance um, from working with a group called Desktop Theatre, who were working in a chat room called The Palace, which was a, a 2D graphic sonic social chat room. And we were also using iVisit, an early audio visual web conferencing platform. And the tools that, that we had 20 years ago, in fact, are not so different to what we have today. Um, the, the palace was different to what we're in now, but it had many similarities with you having an avatar that you could move around and, and this kind of thing. And back then, um, there were also virtual worlds um, such as Habbo Hotel and Active Worlds that were forerunners of this kind of environment that we're in today and that there are now so many more of. And speaking of forerunners, um, I just will draw your attention to the, um, see if I can turn around and use my pointer. I would like to point to when was your first online performance? Um, this is a short video that I made recently along with two colleagues, Annie Abrahams and Suzanne Fuchs, who have also been active for a very long time in this area. Um, and we were inspired to make this by last year. So many people uh, saying they were making the first online performance. They were discovering uh, new ways. They were inventing a new art form and all of this sort of thing. And we realized that um, for many people entering the online world from a traditional theater background who'd been working on stage, um, they didn't know about this rich history of online performance that goes back to the very beginnings of the internet. Um, and so we made this very short video just to, to give a tiny little sneak peek into some of the work that has been done. And um, 
you can go and have a look at that. It's only five minutes long, um, and it just gives you a little taste uh, of what is out there. So going back to my early beginnings, um, I would like to talk briefly about Avatar Body Vision. Um, I formed this group in 2002 uh, with Carla Patacek in the UK, Lena Saarinen in Finland, and Vicky Smith in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, you can see us just down on the bottom there, or bits of us anyway, and I visit cameras. Um, and between 2002 and 2007, we created 10 performances, 10 side performances. We've never been in the same physical space together, and Vicky has never met Carla or Lena. Um, but we created all of these shows, um, and you can see some of them there. Let me just click on that one. Um, some of these performances were made um, to be seen purely online. And other ones of them were hybrid performances where one or more of us was in a space uh, with, with an audience in the space. I'm just having a bit of trouble scrolling down here now. Uh, there we go. Um, so we did a, a mixture of, of online, offline performances as well as purely uh, online. And when we were doing this, we were working in the palace and I visit and trying out all kinds of other platforms that we could find. Um, but we were always coming up against limitations. So these were platforms that were not made for artistic purposes. They had been made for business, video conferencing, education, um, social platforms like the palace. And so there were always issues of authentication, that we couldn't change our usernames, that we had to appear as the same avatar, um, sometimes there was just limited functionality or branded interfaces so that, that we always had to have the, um, the brand of, of what we were doing. The platform that we were using was really visible in our performance. And as we were constantly trying to kind of hack the platforms to be able to do what we wanted in them, and we started to dream about having our own purpose-built platform that, that we could design and use that would be a, an artist's tool uh, and designed and led by artists. So in 2003, we managed to receive a little bit of funding from the New Zealand government uh, and we created Upstage. Uh, it was built during 2003 and launched in 2004. And it is a browser-based platform, which is of which there are many now, um, but back then there weren't so many. Uh, there was no requirement for the audience or the performers to download any software. And for the audience, there's no login. You just click on a link. Um, you can click on a link in a, in a, a web page or an email. So it's super accessible and it functions across all operating systems and all browsers and also on dial-up internet, which was very important at that time. Um, Vicky lives in a rural area and she didn't get broadband for quite some years. Uh, nowadays, most people do have uh, better connections, but still a lot of people have bad internet access. So we've always tried to make Upstage be as accessible as possible for both artists and audience. Uh, so how does it work? What is it? It's basically a, a blank canvas or a, an empty room where uh, logged in players can upload and manipulate all kinds of digital media in real time to create a live performance for an online audience. And the audience can interact via a text chat. And since 2004, there have been many, many performances, presentations, workshops, and events in Upstage. Um, if you have a look on the website under the festivals menu, uh, you can see there's documentation from the different festivals here, uh, and there are various videos um, that you can see with, with show real information about um, the different performances. Our documentation is a bit patchy because we've been uh, 
almost entirely unfunded. We've only ever had very small bits of funding here and there. Um, so we've just done the best that we could do. Um, and uh, when we first built it in 2003, we had to build the software using Flash. Um, this was the only way to achieve what we wanted in 2003. And of course, you have to remember that this time was in terms of the internet, a pretty early time for sort of multimedia on the internet. Um, there were no smartphones, there were no mobile devices, there was no social media, there was no YouTube. Um, blogging was the latest thing. But it very soon became clear to us that Flash would become obsolete. And so almost from the beginning, we were trying to raise money to actually completely rebuild the platform um, without Flash, but it's very difficult for a small artist-led and truly global project to find this fun this kind of funding that we needed. Um, but happy to say that we finally did succeed. Uh, last year, we received funding from Creative Europe for the Mobilize Demobilize project, and this is allowing us to do a complete rebuild of Upstage um, and when I say complete, it's throwing out what we had before and starting again. And you can imagine that from 2003 to 2020, the technology, not only flash, but a lot of technology has changed. So we really needed to do this. Um, and Creative Europe have funded this project, Mobilize Demobilize, which is an artistic project addressing the theme of Mobilize Demobilize and what that means for contemporary society in terms of um, sustainability and environmental issues, um, also technology, obviously, mobile technology, um, and also humanity as we move or don't move. And we actually created this theme in 2019 before the pandemic. And by the time we got the funding, it had actually become even more uh, relevant as we were suddenly all faced with, with being a lot less, well, those of us who had been very mobile in the Western world were suddenly discovering what it's like to, to run into borders and to not be as mobile as we thought we were. So this is a, a complete rebuild of the, the platform, removing the dependency on Flash and adding many enhancements, in, including more tools for the audience and many other features. I was hoping to be able to show you today what we've got because we just have made the first um, beta release that the artists are starting to work on, but I discovered that I can't actually show this uh, website inside the virtual world. So you will just have to wait um, a little bit for that. So I would um, tell you how Upstage is different, for example, from the space where, where we are in now, um, because you could say, why can't we uh, do a performance here um, on this stage that we're on right now? Um, well, there are a number of things that are that are different. Uh, the first thing is that everyone sees and hears the same thing. I'll actually, I'll just go back to the Upstage website so that you can be seeing the pictures um, there. The, these are screen grabs from performances in the previous Upstage, and the new Upstage is a bit different, but it still gives you an idea. Um, so rather than being a three-dimensional space where people who are in it have to look around and, and find where to focus. It's a two-dimensional space. You're just looking at the, the screen, which in, in some ways you might think is limiting, but in other ways it, it means that everybody is focused on the same way, on the same direction, the same visual um, appearance of, of everything together. Uh, a bit like being seated in a dark auditorium and everybody focused onto the stage. Uh, another difference is that you don't have to be you. So avatars can be shared. Um, all the media that you've got on your stage can be shared by all the players that are there. So you can play as somebody else or as something else or whatever you want to be. And this is a really um, big difference between social media and conferencing platforms where authenticity is really important. Um, and the next thing is that there's an dis important distinction between artists and audience. Uh, and we had some early experiences in the palace where we came to realise that we wanted a platform where 
we as artists could have some control over the performance and yet still integrate audience input. So over the years of our experience, we've worked out ways to do this that allowed the audience to be audience, but still have an interactive function and the performers to have certain control over what we were doing. Um, I already talked about it being easy to access and audiences um, used to have a lot of trouble coming to even an upstage performance, but of course they're much more sophisticated now, um, a lot as the result of the pandemic. But a lot of my work over the last 20 years has been educating the audience. And so we've always tried to keep barriers to participation and entrance to, to a minimum. And also it's quite low tech really. So as a player, as a logged in artist, you can learn the basics in an hour um, and you can quite quickly begin to be uploading your own media and creating your own show. So the platform is artist led, artist designed and it's open source. So as, as artists, we come up with all kinds of different ideas of what we want to do. Uh, and then we collaborate with open source developers to try and achieve this. It's highly customizable. It's a blank canvas, an empty space, a, a cyber performance venue where you as an artist have freedom about, about how it looks and what media you use in it uh, and how, how you put that together. So that you can combine multiple digital media from, from audio visual streams to pre-recorded sounds and video. You can have live drawing, you can have live text where you're typing in. Um, avatars can move around um, and speak with a computerized voice. There's the text chat, which is actually a very important part of most performances. Um, it's very integral. So that's just a very brief overview and I invite everyone to have a look on the websites that I've showed to find out more and to see the documentation. Um, the new platform will be launched uh, in the middle of October this year with a, a performance series, Mobilize, Demobilize, on the, the theme um, that we have the, the Creative Europe funding for. And uh, following the, the launch in October, we will be having online workshops to introduce interested artists to the platform. Um, and I just should add also that um, the server-side software for Upstage, it's open source. So uh, anybody can actually take it and create their own instance. Uh, for example, we're talking with a university that is interested to offer it to their students so they can put Upstage on their own network and host it there and have complete control over that server. Um, and then we have our Upstage project server, which we are going to be making available to artists that want to, to use it and try it out and to create performances in. So we really welcome everyone to get in touch um, and there are ways to contact us on the, on the websites there. Um, and we welcome your interest and your, your questions um, at, about Upstage and Cyberformance. And that's, that's it. I hope I didn't go too much over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I think that we can take a couple of questions uh, right after uh, Beth's uh, pr presentation. Okay, great. Is it okay with you? And I'll just take a seat. Of course. Yeah. I'll just Thank take you. a seat. Uh, welcome back, uh, Beth. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so Beth will be presenting performance in real in virtual spaces and uh, Beth, the stage is all yours. Thank you. I'm going to get the Google slide going, get into the right. There we go. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. It's morning for me. Um, one second, please. So I'm really, I'm really grateful for Judith. Um, let me turn up this rolling. It's so hard to see. There we go. Uh, really grateful and thankful to Judith and, and her whole staff here at Recoverso for inviting me again. 
Um, <clears throat> you will pardon the scratchy voice at 6 a.m. here where I am, which is Calgary, Canada, uh, a place traditionally known as Mokinsis in the Midwest of this continent near the Rocky Mountains. Um, and I want to take a moment to uh, thank Helen for the work that she's done over the years, which has laid foundations for, for so many of us um, and is really, really interesting and exciting thinking. I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, the internet and the sacrifices uh, of the earth and the people harvesting the elements from deep within the earth to allow this connectivity and the privilege we have to access each other through these cables and the machines that we're sitting with. Um, and accessibility is something that plagues our digital world um, as does sustainability. So I'm deeply grateful to do this, to be here, to do the work that I do, but I'm aware of the cost of it to the generations to come, to the people here now, and I hope that going forward we find ways towards equality, accessibility, and sustainability. So uh, me, uh, uh, as Elam said in the introduction, oh, and the slides aren't advancing. There we go. The slides are advancing. This is me. I am a mom, this is my son Aaron, this is me nursing while focusing lights on a theater stage back when we were allowed on them. Uh, he's now nine. Um, I've been designing lighting set and video for over 30 years and five years ago um, I began to actively explore the intersections of VR and AR. Technology has always been a significant part of my work. I'm one of the first projection designers in Canada. I'm one of the few female projection designers in Canada, uh, which is a whole other presentation. But um, the work that I do now with VR and AR um, arose from questions about what we can create now by engaging with these emerging technologies and how we can as theater artists <clears throat> influence their development so that we can all move into the creative future together. I created a work pre-COVID called Bury the Run that blended live performance, VR and AR. Uh, which experimented with object theater, which experimented with collective creation, uh, and which was a fully hybrid live carbon reality, virtual reality, and augmented reality performance. Um, I also am a member of Kira Benzig's studio, Double Eye Studios, out of New York City. Um, we created Finding Pandora X, that was uh, a piece of VR theater that premiered at the Venice Film Festival and just performed at South by Southwest. Um, and among many things, I am crafting one of Canada's first theater-centric artist residencies with Canadian Stage in Toronto. I'm developing a VR collective creation with the Blythe Festival Young Company, which is in a rural setting. Uh, and I've begun forming a national VR theater company in Canada that will um, not unlike Helen, um, that will be creating an open source platform uh, for VR performance. Um, and so um, I have spent an enormous time, as I'm sure most of us have, in, in immersive virtual spaces over the last five years, um, in particular over the last year. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about what the future of that virtual space is and what it means for engagement in carbon and physical spaces. I suppose I'm most deeply interested in moving further along this path of post-symbolic communication and collaborative dreaming that VR innovator and philosopher Jaron Lanier um, has always envisioned. In, in one of his 52 definitions of VR, because it's so easy to define, uh, in his book, The Dawn of New Everything, he, he defines VR as a coarser simulated reality that fosters appreciation of the depth of physical reality in comparison. <clears throat> As VR progresses into the future, he continues, human perception will be nurtured by it and will learn to find ever more depth in physical reality. 
So ever more depth and physical reality. As a theater maker, this is compelling to me. I've always known that VR offers us insights that we can't gain from the physical world exclusively. The liberation from physics, the ability to fly, the continuously unfolding, changing, fluid world provides us as makers and audience members access to other ways of thinking and doing. And it opens the doors to exploring other world views freed from time, from gravity, and from our own bodies. Um, the rules of our physical world cease to exist. And this, uh, as we know, provides extraordinary possibilities for what um, we as artists are then capable of doing or able to express. So I'm here to think uh, about space with you all in this um, pretty traditional conference hall. Um, and space is a complicated thing right now as uh, we're so, we've become so acutely aware of it in the last year. Um, the virus has made space precious and terrifying. And I suspect we're more commonly aware of space and shared space now than ever before. As a theater and live performance maker and designer, my entire artistic life has been about the crafting of space <clears throat> and exploring the storytelling capacity of space. As theater makers are expert at understanding relationships within the 3D space, how to create it, how to create within it, and use it to communicate story, emotion, and feeling to our audiences. So space, and this is what I've been exploring in VR ultimately, is safe. And VR allows for the creation of space. It holds affordances for artistic creation, collaboration, and performance, live performance. So again, like Helen was speaking about cyber performance, that element of live, that's a critical piece for theater makers. And it's the powerful magic key that we can share in this VR virtual creative space. We can share this live which means it also contains massive possibility for working <clears throat> for working in a in a decolonized non-hierarchical way bringing in line with each other designers developers performers directors and writers in a way that is not commonly seen in the so-called real world um, this to these tools allow us to uh, us makers to explore and scale and materials in a way we can't in the physical world, which I think then modifies how we look at and engage with physical space when we re-enter it. Not unlike how you can't look at the world in the same way after you've flown in an airplane, VR offers the ability to then expand and explore what we know and influences how we think about that physical space. So how can we experiment and play in that virtual space with things like fire, lifting a mountain, moving walls, um, how does this give us more tools uh, for expression as theater makers? Um, I mean, AR is going to be how we finally get dragons on stage. So this is a very exciting place to be. And adding <clears throat> to that, I've had deeply profound experiences in VR, embodied experiences where I leave with a memory, a body memory of the event. And each of these events contain really important clues for us as artists and performance makers on how to create meaningful and beautiful interactions in VR. So over the last year, I've been running performance creation experiments in VR using the social VR platform, VRChat. But it all actually started here at Laval VR at the 2020 conference with the very first public experiment with the intention of engaging the attendees to create performance using only the tools available in Verbella, which we've all played around with the F keys. And so we're limited in modes of expression here, but we have them. So I brought together 20 people for this experiment. Nobody knew each other. They were from all over the world. Some people's mics worked, some people didn't. Um, we had varying degrees of stability on their internet, um, but we brought them together and what was great is that it actually failed right off the bat. We managed to gather everyone in a circle and the goal was for the first person to pick one of those F key actions. Here, I'm going to try to do it while I talk. 
um, and then and then pass it on to the next person who would then copy the first one and add theirs. It's a super basic theater training game, but it was impossible in this format. And the problem was that the third person POV of your Bella, no one really had any sense of where they were in the circle or who was beside them. There was no embodied experience or sense of space or proximity or relationship. So with the over 80 people watching, the thing totally didn't work. Um, and But then we moved on to part two where each team was placed within one of the audio isolated spaces and told that they needed to use the, the available tools still and the space that they were given to create a one to three minute performance really, really fast, like feast taught today, really fast. They were given five minutes to connect and talk about what they wanted to do, five minutes to rehearse, and then each of the five groups presented their performances. And what resulted was a fascinating, entertaining, weird, and often hilarious testament to the ability of people to create <clears throat> and use the tools at hand to create magic. As the audience, we bore witness to this strange and wonderful collision of avatars and existing space and being in the space and Verbella presented challenges, right? Because it's not um, modifiable. It's um, in the environment itself is modeled after uh, traditional meeting spaces. This meant that the sonography was actually created with the bodies of the avatars. And now, as was reflected back to me after the event by uh, about the event by a participant, it felt alive. The space came alive and it felt like a happening, um, which he was referring to those art parties, those wild art parties in, in the US in the early 60s. And in our in our happening, because it was a big group and it was amazing, and all these weird things were happening. In our happening, not only did the avatar bodies create the sonography but they changed the energy of the environment, just like live theater does, and created something that was spontaneous and live. <clears throat> and the audience members participated in an act of collective experience. With the exception of Kent Bai, everyone was engaging through WebXR, as I'm sure we're doing now in front of a screen, but through the screen, they were having a live real-time reactive experience, <clears throat> as were the performers. And for me, in reflecting about it, um, the event transcended the screen. Uh, when I think about the performance, I have a very real three-dimensional, immersive, embodied sense memory of it because the space was made active through our interactions and therefore alive, which is what we aim to do in theater. So this, this leads to the alt space experiments <clears throat> so Altspace, as many of you probably know, is a social VR platform where it's pretty simple for users to build their own worlds. I chose it because the onboarding is pretty frictionless and you can create space in the world in real time. So in these experiments, again, I bring strangers, mostly new adopters, many of them theater makers together in headset. Um, split them into groups and give one person in each world world builder status, which allows them to create unique uh, in world elements. And with these experiments, we were restricted. I restricted them to the simple low poly geometrics to ensure world stability. And then within the time limits, which were a little bit longer, they were asked to create a three to five minute work of performance. The goal was simple to see if the creation methods that I use frequently in my work those of design-led collective creation uh, that I use in the physical theater could be employed in the virtual context. And these experiments too became something larger for me. They were about what do we have and what are we missing in these platforms to be able to create effective, moving, beautiful works of live performance. And this is all part of the research leading to a, a bespoke platform. And so the resulting works after 45 minutes of creation time, so they had loads of time compared to Laval VR, uh, encompassed active installation experience, interactive storytelling, games, and traditional-ish uh, theatrical performances. They were immersive, moving, funny, beautiful. Each group uniquely explored the scenographic space and how to engage with it, each other, and with the audience. 
And it was encouraging and inspiring to see what could be created with ease by groups of strangers working together. And so, um, and I'm more than happy to take any of you on a little guided tour because the stenography remains in the metaverse. So with artists, um, we, can, we can subvert these places using available tools and almost instantly create the foundations of performance work. Imagine what could be created when the technology actively works with us. So how much further can our understanding of space be pushed? What does that mean for the stories we can tell and the experiences we can have? How, can, how fluid can improvising and collaborating in a VR space become? Um, and I believe we can learn a tremendous amount from this VR space that we have now and bring that into the physical theater space. Stenography in the carbon world is rarely fluid. The closest we have come is adding video and projection elements that are relatively easy to manipulate quickly, but wood and metal can't be. So these magical understandings of space from VR also serve to open up the imagination for what might be possible in the physical world of performance creation, which returns me back to my interest in these intersections. And so as someone who's been creating live performance since she was 14, I totally miss being in the theater space, the one that I can touch and smell and get lost in. But I know when I finally get back into one, I'm going to want to fly. Thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward, I guess we hopefully still have time for questions. And, I'm, and thank, thank you, Helen, you. for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, for this uh, very inspiring uh, uh, presentation, too. So um, we can, um, like, I, I, I will use the, the class, too, <laughs> with a little bit of delay. Yes, yeah, so uh, is there any questions from the audience? to Helen or Beth or both. Um, so we have a question from uh, Sishmi. Uh, she or he, I don't know, he says, in as far as the body of the audience part of the special experience in your immersive and interactive artworks uh, is, as, okay. Did you ever made experiments with the reception situation of the viewers? I guess this is for Beth. Uh, this? Uh, yes, okay. This yeah, this is a question for you, Beth. Okay. I'm just reading over it again. Is the body of the audience the body of the audience absolutely it's a it's a significant part and i think that understanding comes from my work in immersive theater um but the body of the audience uh which is part of what vr gives us is a really interesting tool in finding pandora we actually made the audience um a greek chorus to allow them to be uh participatory and but to give them a, a physical presence uh, and Im import in the story. Um, so the, and in that case, they also had things that they had to do with the, the experiments. And certainly with my, with Barry the Wren, the audience's body was really important. Um, the, in the experiments, a lot of the, the artists were uh, playing with placement of audience body and uh, using that then to influence how they were telling the story. So whether that was um, it was a guided, like a, uh, a, a guided ambulatory performance, or it was a, a static performance where the audience bodies became part of the scenography. I think in in the ex experiment in Laval VR, the audience by nature became. Uh, their bodies became part of the, the interactive work. Um, and they actually ended up forming walls around, they created the walls of the performance space. So it's, it's really interesting. And I think too, for me, what I've been very curious about is, is giving the audience body that isn't body as we understand it. So particle or element, um, and what, what does that mean? And this is what the magic of, of VR gets to give us. Thanks for your question, Shishini. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, uh, we got uh, another question for uh, Helen. So um, from Anna uh, Fernandez. 
she says, can every artist use the app stage or mobilize, demobilize platform? Okay, um, thank you for the question. And um, just first, I just would like to say uh, thank you to Beth for her talk, which was super interesting and inspiring. Um, so to answer the question, can every artist use Upstage? And the the platform is Upstage and Mobilise, Demobilise is the artistic project. Um, so the answer to the question is yes, <laughs> every artist can use it. Um, we, we are currently working out how we are going to make the, the platform sustainable into the future because it's been sustained for the last 18 years largely on voluntary time um, and a few tiny bits of funding. So one of the things we are looking at is whether we have a, a kind of subscription system where people who want to use it would make some kind of payment. But um, we're also super conscious that we are freelance artists ourselves. We have precarious incomes. Um, and, you know, our main um, goal is to have people using the platform. So we're also talking about how people could volunteer or they could do different things to contribute and support the platform um, as well as using it. So we certainly don't want to be excluding any people that, that can't afford to, to use it. Um, and there'll be information on both the Upstage website and the Mobilise Demobilise website as soon as we start planning the, the open sessions that we'll have in sort of late October. And there's a mailing list on the Upstage website. You can find the link to join the mailing list. Everybody is welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for, uh, for your answer. Uh, maybe we can uh, take one last one uh, before we move on with our program. Uh, um, uh, I will take this of uh, Elise Asport uh, because it's addressed both for uh, Ellen and uh, uh, and Beth. Uh, so uh, she says, of course, it's a performance, so in real time. But did you keep tracks of these cyber for, uh, cyber performances, you both? Because for me, it's a little bit abstract. Um, well, I can I can speak to that. Um, I. It was funny, Helen, you talked about the challenge in documentation, It's which is very true. Um, I, I have been able to document m these experiments. Um, capturing video in VR is still not a thing that is great. Um, but actually, if you go to the Playground Studio Vimeo right now, there is um, just raw footage of, of some of the collaboration and one of the performances. Um, so yes, I have tried to capture it as much as possible because it is, it goes by really fast. It's ephemeral. It's just, it's just like live theater. Um, and then it's gone, but we're also left with, and I'm happy to take you on a tour in alt space. Um, I'm also left with the sonographies that have been created. So I'm able to, in some ways, then it's like walking through a museum of performance. I'm able to walk through and try to animate it. Um, and, um, but what's great is there is a, the physical space, the virtual physical space that, is, that remains. So um, I've, I've done some of that. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard though. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree with with Beth. It's always a, a kind of a a conflict even that I have because um, like with theatre, you know, it's really super difficult to create documentation that that really captures it because you lose the liveness and the video is immediately dead. Um, and also, what I've found with with the work that I do is uh, when you record it. Um, all of the, the moments of lag or, or when things didn't quite function technically become so much more obvious. When these things happen in real time, everybody knows it's real time. They know that lag happens, delay happens, that sometimes uh, technically something doesn't work. But we see it in the recording. People really notice it because we're so used to really, really good uh, video and, and film and, and cinematography and everything that is that is so perfect. So then the, the documentation always feels very kind of like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's never as good as you want it to be. Um, but of course, we have to do it 
and we do do it as as much as we can. So the, it is there. But um, I I very only occasionally put like a complete unedited recording available online. I would usually just edit out some small excerpts to kind of give an idea. Um, yeah, and just one other thing too, in the new upstage when it's launched, hopefully we'll we'll manage to implement this feature. We might run out of time, but we want to have a playback feature, which is something that I found quite early on in, in Moos and MUDs, which were these very early text environments, um, where you could you could record the sequence of messages that were sent by the server, and then you could play it back. So the idea is that in Upstage, you could have these, these messages recorded by the, the server, and the playback function would actually sort of recreate what you had done with all of the different messages. So it would be a ki another kind of recording. But uh, what it wouldn't do is recreate the streams. So if you were using live audio or video streams, you would have to record those separately. So this is one of the things that the developers um, who are really amazing magicians, I have to say, um, they, they're they exploring at the moment how we can do this, what kind of a solution we can find that would allow that. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for, uh, for your answer. Um, and thank you again for uh, being uh, part of uh, uh, Recto Verso uh, of conference program, uh, Helen and Beth. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Uh, Thank you. It's been really interesting. Yes, yes, absolutely. Really and I myself have a lot of questions uh, that I will <laughs> ask you later, but uh, maybe we can do this uh, uh, later. But um, we need to move on with uh, our program and uh, uh, and to continue the session with uh, to welcome artists, uh, selected artists, and uh, uh, and uh, ar uh, artists invited artists for the Recto Verso this year. And this session uh, called uh, uh, Creations and Adaptations is, uh, will be moderated by uh, uh, Gaëtan Le Coarer that I invite on stage. And uh, <laughs> uh, hi, uh, Gaëtan. Thank you again, Helen and uh, Beth. Um, and uh, see you later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello, fellow avatars. So, uh, I, I want to thank every member of the organization staff of the, this event. So, thank you, Judith, Adam, and uh, everyone else. Uh, unfortunately, Unfortunately, I don't uh, know everyone, but uh, thank you. So um, uh, today we will talk about uh, online art creation and adaptation. So it's kind of obvious that uh, the notion of adaptation is really important today because all artists have to adapt uh, and all designers have to adapt to the situation and have to adapt sometimes their work on different platform or um different subjects and today we we will have uh, four amazing artists i want to say uh, uh, amazing human being to um come here to show their work so i want to call on stage um jean Suspuga. oh sorry i, I mispronounced this jean suspugas sorry uh julien lomé uh, next, uh, we have uh, Natalia Velikanova and uh, Martina Milligan. I don't know if they're here. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, so to be quick, because uh, the, the time running fast, uh, I am Gaetan Okoya. I'm, I'm a PhD student. I'm working uh, on graphic novel and mixed reality to a new species of narration, and today will be your moderator. So I won't stand here more longer. Uh, just um, uh, to introduce uh, 
globally the, the different subjects we, we will talk about. Um, I think we have uh, four artists who share uh, uh, in common the, the notion of sensibility or the, the approach of the, the expression of the body and um, through the uh, we will cross uh, several experiences and discourses uh, discourses during this uh, panel so i think uh, to begin this travel through space and this uh, and sensitivity um we will start with uh, the artwork artwork of jeanne suspugas so um, uh, to present this uh, this artist so um wait 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 uh, uh Jean, uh, actively engaged with but without um, being militant Jean, Jean Suspigas approach points to the all the forms and strategy of confinement to question an individual relation to himself and to the other the media she explores allow herself to consider various aesthetic terms that determine the one and uh, in an uh, obs obsessive world who is in turn confused or reassured concerned or serene solitary or with complicity her work has been shown in various places around the world like berlin or villa medicis in rome Pal palazzo delle papese in siena Palais de tokyo in paris but also in uh, in Mocha in Toronto, as well as in major events such as Dublin Contemporary, Biennale of Alexandria, and Shanghai, Constellation, preopening of Centre uh, Pompidou Metz, International Vidéonal in Detroit, Detroit, and uh, Nuit Blanche in Paris, or uh, 100 artists at Montpellier in two 2019. Her films have been shown in numerous festivals as uh, artists, Saint Pompidou Pai, Don Carlo International Festival, Miami International Festival. Articles have been re written about her work in Art Press, Art in America, New York Times, Le Monde, Figaro, Flash Art, L'Oeil, Boza Magazine, Corona Boreal. In 2013, she received uh, the Applying Prize for Contemporary Art, having been nominated by Arlan Arlan in, uh, in uh, 2015. She got the Arts Pay, uh, Arts Per Philip Prize. And I think uh, today she will present a hard work where my la um, whoa, sorry, where my house lives and here I let her speak. We just put some images on the stage. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not working when ah uh, uh, <laughs> and then... uh, uh Gaetan, is this uh hmm? uh the link uh, to the website? Yes. Yes, yes, it's working. It's working now. And uh, here another link on the on the screen. Uh, the website is working, uh, Gaëtan. Mm -hmm. mm. 
Um, is is John talking because we we are? Uh... I don't know. Okay. Uh... Ah. Okay. And then. Okay. So, Jan, uh, do you hear us? What? I don't know. Do, do you hear us? Quelqu'un peut check? Uh, we can't. We cannot hear you. Jan. Um. Hmm. Everybody saw the the animation on the the second screen. No. No. Okay. Um. Start over. So, you in front of you you have the website uh, designed by by Jean. So we will see. Um, a short, a short animation, uh, and uh, it will speak for itself. I think. So you have to click on uh, the English version, and then select the the red red window, and it will start along. Um, maybe uh, by the time we uh, understand why uh, we can't hear Jan, uh, mm -hmm. maybe we, uh, we mm -hmm. invite someone else. So, um, meanwhile, uh, when we try to figure out, figure out what is going on, uh, maybe we can uh, continue with uh, Natalia Velikanova, and uh, you yeah. can. Uh, Come up stage and uh, show show us your your work. It'd be great. So now we share your screen. Tick tick tick. Bingo! You have your your slide. Thank you. No. What? Cannot hear Natalia also. I, I don't see actually the slides. Ah. Okay. I don't hear you well. Okay. So uh, the slide are, is. Uh, just behind you. Turn around, you will see it. Uh, I actually don't. <laughs> what? Why? I don't know, uh, but if everybody uh, see them, uh, there is no problem. I will just ask you to change them. Oh, okay, it's coming. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Okay, I do see so it. It's no delay. <laughs> 
No, it's okay. 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 It's malediction of, of the live yeah, performances. Yeah. <laughs> so, hi everybody. M my name is Natalia Velikanova. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I wanted to thank all the team of the festival for the invitation and for their support. So, this talk is about intersection in immersive art experiences in virtual reality that is presented at Rectoverso this year. Introspection is an artistic journey of self-exploration. It is about looking deep inside ourselves to discover the hidden universe that exists within all of us. We wanted to offer the public a new perception of reality and of the world around us through the virtual experiential artworks. I call it experiential because there is a true difference between an artwork, an object, and an artwork, an experience, actually. And so we would like to ask to the public uh, to meditate on these uh, two existential questions. Is reality universal or specific to each one of us? Is the world around us a simple illusion, a construction of the mind? Through the three art experiences, the public is invited to an introspection in order to find their own personal answers to these questions. Scenario is built in several stages in different digital universes that transport you on this human and philosophical journey. For a few minutes, you are immersed in a deep space of your own consciousness. And when you return, will reality still seem as solid to you as before? The journey starts in an in-between space called Capsule. We created this spherical intimate cocoon-like space that plays the role of the medium between the guide and the visitor. Uh, in digital space in general, you know, it may be very frightening to find yourself all alone in an unlimited open area. So this Capsule is a sort of psychological protection for the visitor. EXO is our virtual guide and the narrator that gives the visitors the keys of understanding of the artworks because digital art is still part of contemporary art it can be really misunderstood by the public and they really need some instruction to appreciate it uh, in, in the best manner so exo doesn't have an embodiment only her voice is present in the capsule she presents each artworks and gives the visitor some questions to think about and then the story begins the first artwork is called I Thought. Immersed in a dark and intense atmosphere, the visitor is invited to see his own thoughts. This artwork in 360 degrees is composed of voices, sounds, and digital matter. So the visitor will explore his individual consciousness in order to perceive concepts that are very present, but often buried in our subconscious. We wanted to visualize basically the thinking process in a calm mind when you are able to see your thoughts one by one. We can only do it in a meditative state because normally we have just thousands of them in the same time, so we don't see them one, one by one. So this dark environment represents the mind, calm mind, and the colorful, colorful particles composing abstract forms represents your thoughts. The second artwork is called Loft. It brings us to a well-known and familiar space, a home, in order to continue the reflection that we have started before. This imaginary loft is filled with everyday objects that we all know very well. In this experiment, we are questioning the idea of the representation of a solid and permanent world around us that we believe in so much. Everything seems normal at the beginning, but little by little, all the things around starts to transform. And in the end, the whole environment is completely different. We are not in the loft anymore, but in a, in a kind of fantastic cave with the lakes, some vegetation, insects, waterfalls. The visitors stay for some time inside this piece of nature, and then everything comes back to the initial loft. This process is similar to a state of deep thinking when we lose a little bit a sense of reality and imagine ourselves somewhere else. I think we all did this exercise uh, a lot of times during the, the last year. <laughs> so this is kind of internal escape. 
The third artwork is called the Deja Reflector. The reflection game continues and ends with this last creation, with the questioning of our perception. We observe a sort of complex mechanism that produces mental visions in the form of a huge levitating cube. In perpetual motions, various images are formed on the surface of this cube. This mechanism represents our consciousness that continuously mixes the images that we've already seen. It's like uh, our memories, souvenirs, and all the things that we already experimented. It starts with the nice pictures of the nature, then it shows humans from their good side, let's say, then it shows the urban life and our crazy rhythm, then the society of consumption uh, with all these issues that we <laughs> know very well, and it finished by violence. So the question I would like to say, is this kind of rhythm that will, the cycle that will repeat after forever? This random hypnotic and fluid movement is at the origin of the creation of our experience and memories. And what if we, all, we had already seen it all? At the end of the experience, the visitor comes back to the capsule to come back slowly to his own reality. So introspection, the stereoscopic thing for VR, it is a seated static solo experience. We wanted it to be the most comfortable for the visitor. Everything is done to avoid cyber sickness and other undesirable effects. The seated position is better for relaxing and meditating. So here is the team that helped me to create introspection. And I would like you to, uh, to, t to say a few words about our first test on the public. So here we have uh, some testimonials, the true authentic testimonials. Uh, so, but I will conclude this. Uh, we, we've showed it to people from eight to 78 years old, and most of them had stars in their eyes after taking off the VR headset. That was very pleasant to see. Children appreciated the experience despite it philosophical dimensions and we were quite surprised by the reaction of the oldest ones. They adored it and were completely comfortable with the technology and they wanted to to see it uh, more and more a few times. Uh, the, the side effect that we observe from most of the people is that after the experience they were relaxed and had a sensation of well-being. So introspection is just the first step of Gate 22. I'll tell you a few words about the global project. Gate 22 is a new generation museum of digital arts and design and virtual reality. We'd like to fuse the artwork that is creative, imaginative, and reaching and intimate with a virtual world that is highly technological, immersive, innovative, and limitless. So Gate 22 is a door to a free and imaginative space offering the best digital creations to the public. It's not kind of digital uh, venue that is static and never changing that hosts different um, exhibitions. Uh, I would say that we create uh, the rather the collection of experiences and each one will, will be hosted in a specifically created world, one very different from the others. So the project is surely very digital, but it's still centered on human experiences. We care about the physical comfort of our visitors in VR, but also hope to create the experiences that correspond to their aspirations. Gate 22 is community-based. It, it moves away from the static content to a new dynamic platform. Museums don't have a public, but lots of audiences. We want to offer experiences that are adapted to different social groups to leave mass market museums for, for kind of customized ones. Gate 22 is interactive, as you all imagine, because of VR. And it's nomad by nature, because it may be present in a, in, in a virtual, digital, and also real world. So I invite you to discover introspection in person. It is available, is available on the website of the festival and here in Laval World in Rector area. Thank you very much for your time and don't hesitate to connect with us. Thank you, Natalia.
Thank you. Um, we will wait uh, until the, the end of the presentation for the, if you have some question. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, so Martina, you can uh, can start uh, uploading your 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 presentation, mm -hmm. and I will try to uh, introduce you a little bit. So, um, Martina Medigan is an artist working with interactive and extended reality art. In her works, Martina creates intimate and complex assemblages of um, physical and virtual elements that explore the contemporary self and is its synthetic corporeality. Martina is a university assistant and a lecturer at the Department of Transmedia Art at the University of Applied Art in Vienna, where she teaches digital design and virtuality. She is also a teaching multimedia tool for interactive arts uh, at the IUIV University in Venice, um, digital exhibit and uh, for multimedia art together with Klaus Ubermeyer and Stefano D'Alessio. She is uh, currently head of extended reality and curator at the area for virtual art, a platform for immersive experiences and get together funded by Soundframe and uh, uh, Pasanio. She is also part uh, of the curatorial team of the New Media Art Festival for Vienna. And uh, Martina Minigan currently lives and works in Vienna, Austria. So I don't know if all set for you. Absolutely, all set. Thank you so much for the introduction. Perfect. Hi everyone, hope you can hear me, hope you can see the slides. Um, I also want to thank, thank the whole team that invited me here, really happy to be here with you. Um, so for today's presentation, I'm just gonna uh, talk about the work that was presented at uh, Rectovia So last year, uh, but also some new works uh, within the topic of social VR that I've been working on over the, yeah, over the last year, 2020. Um, so to start, I've been invited last year by Recto Vierso to present one of my VR project, Keep in Touch. Um, Keep in Touch is a virtual reality experience for HTC Vive. And due to COVID and the situation we are all unfortunately um, aware of, uh, it was not possible to have a physical exhibition. So it was quite interesting for me because Keep in Touch was really meant to be or started as a project that was going against a bit the um, overall discussion around the web of VR being this beautiful place one can escape uh, to, so something that is absolutely beautiful and perfect and is not as the reality or the physical reality we're living in. Um, so I'm just going to play for you a short trailer of the project so you get an idea of how it looks. I hope you can see the video. Oh, that's a pity. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, then let me just go back to the picture, please. <laughs> um, I'm going to send in chat after my presentation the link. Uh, you can find all my videos on my website as well. So I'm just going to send my website link after. Um, well, you can see a little bit in this picture and you will see better uh, later on. Uh, I hope that we can see all the videos at one point. So keep in touch. Um, is working that way when you wear the VR headset, you will be surrounded by really huge uh, 3D hands that will come to you and constantly be surrounding you, kind of suffocating the user that is in VR. And those hands are being specifically or consciously uh, rigged in a wrong way. So they move in a way that is not natural. The fingers would you know, go the other way around, they would get into each other's hands. So it's a very eerie and very unpleasant um, experience in VR. And you don't have any controls except for your head. So you, if you move your physical body, you will be able to push those hands away for a very short time. They will then come back to you and surround you again. Um, 
so when I created this project, um, I was really thinking about this idea, this notion of uh, synthetic corporeal reality, which for me is basically to say, um, or uh, an investigation on how can we make the virtual reality perceivable? Um, so how can we send a physical feedback uh, from the virtual to the physical reality? And I think with this project, it really worked because people were um, kind of grossed out being in VR. They would stay either very short or very long, but starting to kind of itch or feeling like ticklish because of these virtual hands. Um, then because of COVID and because of the pandemic and the impossibility of showing my work in VR, I also don't want still at, at, of today really show my VR work because of the headset and the hygienic issues around it. So I started to think, how can I adapt a VR work in another VR virtual platform or in, a, in another virtual environment? And so what I did was basically taking a sort of what you would say in video, a frame, in this case being a 3D model out of a performative action within my VR piece. So I would wear the VR headset, I would push the, hand, the hands away from me, and then I will take a still 3D model of that, of that moment. And that became a sort of um, virtual sculpture of the hands. And this virtual sculpture is exhibited at the Reptovieso Real Body Virtual Body Online Exhibition as a sort of introduction to the piece. And I really like what it does because it becomes really such a static moment out of a very dynamic performative situation that was in VR. And this kind of was a very interesting starting for me in 2020 of how to rethink my previous projects that were dealing with VR um, into different platforms. And Keep in Touch became um, Mozilla Hub's uh, virtual web XR experience. So I don't know if every one of you is um, aware of what Mozilla Hub's is, but um, it's basically um, an open source uh, social VR space that was uh, created or is created by Mozilla Firefox. Uh, you might know the browser. And it's a, space, it's a multiplayer space, so you can be, um, they suggested up to 25 users in the space at the same time. And what I basically did was taking these virtual sculptures of the hands, I had to extremely reduce the polygon count because of the restriction of this uh, social platform. And I created this immersive space where people could gather and be together and explore uh, together. And what, was really interesting for me was that from this very unpleasant uh, VR experience I created, uh, the social VR version of it became a very pleasant, someone even said to me this became their second home during the first lockdown. So I was really interested in, in keeping going with this um, adaptation of my works. Um, so I guess you don't see the video either. I'm just, <laughs> I see it on the presentation tools but I don't know if you can see it on the big screen. I can. Okay, perfect. So maybe the first one was just too heavy. So you see, yeah. um, when you would enter the Mozilla Hub space, you will find a link on my website. You can feel free to just go alone or with friends. You can talk with each other. You can see each other's avatars. You can type in chat and you can explore together. And after this first um, adaptation of my project, I kept going on and even I've been asked to use my um, my hands as not as an artwork as it was first intended, but as an exhibition display. And it was really a really funny uh, process for me because I am I never really design um, a display for exhibitions, so that was my first attempt in in virtual spaces, and that was created for limited liminal latitude exhibition created by the amazing Tina Sauerlander uh, for Cara Angora, which is um, a project for both exhibition workshops, uh, discussions in, in social VR in Mozilla Hubs. So um, after that, I took some more projects of mine um, that uh, became then Mozilla Hubs or Web XR experiences. And this one that you see hopefully <laughs> in the slide is called, I looked around for you, but I could only find myself. And that was a result of, or like the last iteration of project in which I've been working with um, AR, specifically face filters for uh, both Instagram and Snapchat. 
And the idea was that basically I would provide whoever wanted with a 3D mask of my own face. That was actually my very, very first 3D scan selfie I took some years ago. And the result was basically a collection of videos of users wearing my mask and by that kind of becoming someone else. But at the same time, keeping themselves familiar to me because they all had my face. And what happens in the Mozilla Hub space is that you, similar to the hand, you will have this huge space filled with the items being my face, but you also have avatars being the face. So at the opening, it was really interesting because every person would enter, would grab the face avatar and would become part of the environment. Um, but also the identity of each of the, per of the people being in the space would kind of dissolve. And it was really hard to find each other. People would start to try type in chat, where are you? And it was really hard to, yeah, to, you know, to, to form groups. And it became just a kind of this big performative action that um, user were not expecting to be part of, but somehow they became part of. Um, so I then created another Mozilla Hub space. This time it was not meant to be any performance happening in there. Uh, it's called All Alone Together. And as you can see, hopefully <laughs> again in the video, uh, the Mozilla Hub space is basically filled with my own 3D scan bodies. Uh, they're all clones of myself and they are moving in such a weird ways, kind of a bit between ecstasy and torture. And the movement that you see here actually happened by um, what I call happy mistake in me programming the animation. So I found a script that would generate dance movements. And um, what happened was that the script worked perfectly, of course, with the demo scene, but the moment I applied my own body to the script, somehow the body was um, kind of crushed to the floor and that caused the arms to enter the body, the arm, the legs to be kind of always um, towards the floor and the bodies to enter into each other as well. So for Mozilla Hubs, I did something very similar to the hands project in which I took um, a sort of like, I think it's around 20 seconds animation that looped constantly. And when you enter the space again, alone or with others, you are within this very eerie kind of muffled club dancing scene, uh, but you are also able to go away from it and seeing it as a sort of um, action that happens uh, away from you. Um, and this project was really shown a lot over the last year and in some places was not possible to show it as an actual experience. So um, I created also a virtual sculpture of it which um, was shown at this uh, huge exhibition, The Archive to Come, created by Carla Dennis, which unfortunately is not here with us today, and Telematic Media Arts. And since I created the sculpture, what happens when I, when I'm asked to show this project is the combination of the virtual sculpture plus the link or the portal to the Mozilla Hubs experience. Um, I also adapted a project that was not meant to happen in virtual, but due to COVID, um, it was a really big installation in a museum here in Vienna. Uh, unfortunately, it was only open for one week. And then after the museum closed, I decided to create two iterations of it. One is a live simulation for web, and one is a Mozilla Hub space, which in this case is not really an artwork, but is more um, documentation of the actual work. And that was shown in uh, Mozilla Hub's exhibition called Feelings, created by Synthesis Gallery. So throughout the last year, I've been intensively working with social VR, especially Mozilla Hubs, and I've been teaching uh, in both uh, Vienna um, University, but also in some other workshop and summer schools around. So I've been spreading the love of Mozilla Hubs and social VR to other people. And I'm really happy that students and other people, especially in Vienna, have been using Mozilla Hubs a lot over the last months. And because of that, and I will uh, just go through very quickly and then end my presentation, um, I've been asked by SoundFrame to be part of their team as both curators and head of extended reality. And with that job, I was able to uh, work with a team of amazing 3D artists, uh, namely Maximilian Prad and Enrico Zago, to create social VR 
art exhibitions. And one of them was the area for visual art, which is still open. You can visit anytime and you will find amazing avatars in there to transform your body in the virtual. Um, we also curated the Pixel Bytes and Film exhibition, which is also still online, which features mainly uh, video works by Austrian artists. Maybe I skip, uh, I talked before and then I just quickly show you the last two videos, which are 30 seconds each. And I also been part of the Saiva New Media Art Festival of Vienna, uh, which happened fully virtual in February. And the idea was to use Mozilla Hubs this time, not as an exhibition space for art, but to live events and social gatherings. So we've been creating uh, music um, events, which featured uh, different Mozilla Hub spaces, uh, audiovisual performances, and that was created by Angie Pohl of the SoundFrame team. And I also was designing six different social areas uh, in Mozilla Hubs where visitors of the festival could just gather and have watch parties of the program or just be together with friends and have a chat. So I'm just going to show you the last video of the social areas so you have an idea of how they looked like. Also, the audio is a bit less loud and I can talk over. And um, yeah, so I will uh, share the link of my website and also I will welcome everyone from the 22nd of April. So from next week, um, one of our social area will be free from registration. So open to everyone that wants to join, as well as the music stage area will be open forever for you to jump in and have a look at the audiovisual performances being uh, documented in there and Mozilla Hub spaces to explore. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think Elim has something to say about the next event. No? Dan, tu veux pas préciser le, le warning qu'il y a sur la... Pardon, pardon Gaëtan, je, je gérais non. un truc, tu disais non. Non, tu, voulais pas, tu voulais pas préciser qu'il y a un autre événement là, que tu as euh, 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 on, on continue avec Julien, je vais Ok, 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 bon ça va. <rire> bah, du coup, on va... Pourquoi je suis bloqué hein On va appeler... <rire> Sorry. We will call Julien Lomé on stage. So, same. So, if you can uh, set your your presentation, anyway, I will talk about, more about you. So, Julien Lomé is a research artist in virtual reality at the Inrev Private Laboratory. For four years, he has created an immersive and interactive work questioning the relationship between 19th century painting and immersive technologies. He is currently working on the meta environments and the uh, involvement, involvement of the viewer creator in the interactive landscape. At the same time, Julien practices photography, taking up the major themes of Dutch still life and portraits, playing with ambiguity between painting and photography, which in a, an, an academic Apprenticeship in oil painting. He works and models light in in his various media of expression. He also work on the, the project optical par paradigm, paradigmatic. It's a virtual space inspired by illustration from. Uh, and uh, actually, I will uh, let him talk a little bit more because mm -hmm. it's it's uh, his project and not mine. So. Go. Yes, thank you, Gator, <laughs> for this uh, beautiful presentation. Wow, you're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> so, hello to everyone, and thanks to LM, Judith, and, and Gator for proposing this time of discussions around uh, creation and adaptation. And thanks to Argette uh, for checking my presentation. Uh, this is a subject quite present at the moment with the health and cultural situation, at least in France. Um, well, I'm Julien Lomé, artist researcher at the INREV laboratory at the University of Paris 8. I work on the co-creation of interactive and immersive spectators 
as a tool of creation to virtual environment. Uh, I develop interconnected collaborative uh, virtual worlds in which uh, several spectators perform which, uh, with motion capture system, uh, stereoscopic glasses and position sensors. More generally, I do my research around the performance of a uh, spectator whom I consider as an artist through his ge uh, interactive gestures. So my virtual world are strongly inspired by the theories of uh, academic oil painting from the Italian Renaissance to German Romanticism. I base my work mainly on the idea of uh, introspection of artists and viewer through the experience of an artwork. Uh, besides my research in, on virtual reality, I'm a photographer. Again, my universe uh, revolves around the portrait and pictorial still life, light and shade, and the symbolism of uh, hands and objects. In all my art, I put in, in, uh, an important place to the question of uh, composition. The way an eye turns is uh, as important in photography as the way a viewer moves in a virtual environment. So, Paradigm Optic, my artwork exhibited in uh, Rectoverso 2021, is therefore a link in my two media of expression. Uh, it links photography and virtual reality around the same spirit of composition, rendering and artistic exploration. It was born in December 2020 during the second lockdown in France, when cultural centers, bars and restaurants were closing. As a photographer, I could not uh, longer really exhibit my photographs or virtual reality. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, it was while looking at my partner's uh, graphic illustration that I imagined the idea of uh, in, an interactive uh, virtual museum inspired by his dreamlike worlds uh, in which one could find his illustrations as well as my photographies. From this idea of a museal space came the criticism of a cultural world that was closed and forbidden. More than a simple virtual wandering space, I wanted to it to be an artwork showing artworks, which could be distrib distributed to gallery owners and art buyers. Since I could not use the real spaces to present my photographs and illustrations of my partner, I would create virtual worlds that would allow me to do so. Uh, Paradigm Optic is therefore an interpretation of the graphic universe of A Droite de la Main Gauche Studio, a virtual gallery that can serve as an augmented book, but also an archiving space since uh, some of these artworks has disappeared due to the loss of uh, art drive. As you can see on, on the screen, the two artworks that are showing uh, do not exist um, in an, another format uh, than uh, JPEG. This idea of archiving, not intended, represents in a way the ephemeral life of a digital artwork. It is during this period of creation, but also of doubt and feeling of confinement that I resumed the practice of uh, self hypnosis in order to let my imagination wander without a social pressure. Quickly, I realized during these uh, rumbling sessions that images and ideas of virtual rooms were coming to me, which could uh, constitute the continuity of Paradigm Optic. Oops, just, yes. Um, the virtual museum, inspired by artworks already made and exhibited, took another part in the idea of creation since it was not going to take the form of already existing artworks, but of uh, new hypnosis ideas. Every night, I created a process of uh, self-hypnosis that uh, allowed me to travel virtually through my brain and imagination and not with a computer in a doubly uh, virtual paradigm optic, that is to say a paradigm optic that did not yet exist and only exist virtually and uh, in its finality. These trips allowed me to imagine in depth the appearance of the, mu the new museum rooms, as well as the feeling I wanted to bring to them. 
The following day, fully awake and armed with my sketches made the day before, I started modeling and building. Also, the music realized by Diezoui is based on a similar practice of detachment on my part. Indeed, I propose to the artist to leave the artwork without any music, just visually, then to images, imagine a composition entering in the feeling which I wish to make live. That is to say, the benevolence, the floating, and the perdition. Thus, in, re in relation to his personal feeling and with his own imagination, he proposed this final composition of parodic motif. It, has, it is here for me a very beautiful surprise because usually in my other artworks, I imagine ambient telephonic music, uh, quite special. Whereas Diezoui imagined uh, at the base a piano tune with superpositions of voice and treble percussions. I considered the assertwort finished when I could not travel further during my self-hypnosis sessions. However, I would like to develop not the content, but, the, but its exhibitions formal. Uh, first, I would like to make it in virtual reality and not leave it, leave it on a computer screens. For me, uh, this environment was created to be exper experienced in immersion with a helmet and a free choice uh, of the spectator to use his real body to move forward. I would like to create a real space in which uh, photographic and graphic artworks can be found with a blue night light and a white spotlight, but also a system of augmented reality proposing to spectators to leave the virtual exhibition by tablet or smartphone. And finally, I'm developing a QR code system printed on stickers and fixed in the street. It, is, it seems important uh, to me, especially nowadays with the closing of culture, to, opert, to open art in the street for everybody without event or invitation. As an involuntary but happy meeting, a spectator could flash this QR code and find himself in the virtual museum in the middle of the street and in, uh, in any time of the day. So Parodic Motif is not a fixed artwork. It has several forms of evolution with the content that can be modified within the limits of uh, the existence of real digital artworks. It is accessible to everyone and ask uh, only to be lived rather in a sensitive way. The feeling of incomprehension that is proposed give the uh, advantage of being able to relieve it immediately without paying to observe artworks or details that were missed during the first uh, visit. And I would like to show uh, a short video, a teaser of uh, the artwork. So I will just, oh, it's perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. So I have to excuse, excuse Jen, but uh, there is uh, some uh, technical issues, so she won't be able to talk about her work, but she shared me a little text. So. My phone ring at the same moment. Perfect. Um, 
So um, I will share the real quickly the, the website in which there is the work of, uh, of Jeanne. So um, this project is a collaboration between Jeux de Pomme in Paris and the virtual platform uh, from uh, Brazil. Mata Ponsa, the curator, invited Jeanne to make a project around the lockdown. So here is Where My House Lives, a project by Jeanne Suspigas. Lockdown made us aware of the four walls that surround us. We spent more time than ever before indoors. At home or wherever we were able to find the shelter during those weeks when the whole world seemed to be confined because of the virus. Geoeconomic differences undoubtedly had an impact on living conditions during the various lockdowns, but above all, the situation revealed these functionalities in relationships and accelerated or brought to the surface unstable or even turbulent domestic situations. It was in this unique context that Jan Suspigas began collecting personal accounts of lockdown. These little stories were passed on the writer Claire Castillon, who reinterpreted the situation in order to create powerful imaginary narratives. This collection is not intended as a precise analysis or a sociological study, but rather it offers a palette of experiences, some painful or frust frustrating, others bitter or disturbing, revealing in a powerful and a profound way our reaction in the face of an unknown and unpredictable event. Extreme situation desires, lies, acts of violence, and misunderstandings brought about by co confinement. Between the lines, the artist questioned the role, the role of the home as a place of refuge and emphatically condemns the, the, the way the role of woman regressed as well as the, the increase in domestic violence during this enforced confinement. Through a dozen windows, the, uh, the only opening that we had onto the outside, we will enter these homes in order to listen to the intimate thought and the viewpoints of um, women and men really uh, read by the writer herself. During these weeks, we became one with the interiors and our, our lives, our houses became third person in our lives. There were my house lives. So if you are, uh, have any question for the, this work uh, of, uh, of Jeanne, I suggest you, uh, you go to, uh, to the Recto Verso area and you will see uh, a box with uh, this, uh, this artwork and maybe you will um, be able to, to talk uh, to her directly, I hope. So now uh, I have to tell you that there is another rendezvous, there is another event on the, on the beach uh, starting, starting pretty much now. So if you want to go, you can. But also if you have uh, some uh, question for the, the rest of the, of the panelists here, um, don't hesitate in the, in the chat and uh, we'll uh, share it to, the, to this uh, three artists. And of course, uh, again, you can show, see the, the work of uh, Martina or Julien or Natalia also in the Recto Verso uh, exhibition area. So, no question? Thank you very much, Gaëtan. Thank you. Uh... Okay. I will join you. Uh, so, uh, um, if there is no questions, uh, yes, uh, yes. So, uh, thank you, Natalia, Martina, and Julian for your presence here. We are very happy to have you. Uh, 
and to listen to your very inspiring uh, presentations and to be inspired also by your work. Mm -hmm. I really, really liked it uh, personally. So um, if you if you like, we can go now on the beach and uh, join uh, uh, join uh, the public there and uh, continue with uh, our program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, okay. If if you uh, if you don't know how to go, uh, so you have to click on go to. Go to. Yes, uh, Recto Festi Virtual Festival 2021 and Beach. See you there. Campus and Beach. Mm -hmm. I will try to join a bit later. I have to go recording my lecture for my students. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for having me. So hopefully see you later. Thank you, Natalia. Thank see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you can hear me, Helen, um, that's great to meet you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Helen and and Beth, if you like to go to the to the to the beach and continue the program, there is a, a you can click on Go to um, Recto Verso Festival 2021 Beach. Thanks, Helen. I actually uh, have you. another presentation in an hour, and I have to oh. go out and. and find out the tech for that yeah. okay this okay is, uh, yeah my life at the moment <laughs> okay thank thanks you very much it's been really great thank Friday you thank you. Busy day. thank you <laughs> helen uh, so uh